Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let all that is within me praise his holy name. As we reflect on God's blessings and goodness for the trials and the triumphs of this last year, let us remember this morning as we worship the Lord that he is the God who has been faithful in times past and is our hope and fidelity for years to come. I came down 51 this morning, past two golf courses about a mile away, and on both golf courses, right and left, people were pulling out their clubs and playing in spite of the rain. And I thought, well, they're doing it. I wonder what Calvary will do this morning. And you've come with great enthusiasm and strong presence and good attendance. So thank the Lord. This is his day, and the people will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Before you are seated, turn around and uh, say hello to half a dozen people and wish them God's blessing for this new year. If you are visiting with us this morning and not part of Calvary's church family, will you reach in front of you there in the pew rack and take out a card that will give you an opportunity to tell us that you're visiting with us today or that you're coming occasionally? And if you have those that you have brought with you as your friends and neighbors, will you take the leadership there and the loving initiation? and get one of those cards and give it to those who are seated with you today. Next year, Christmas is on a Tuesday, and uh, the Christmas and the New Year's celebration falling on uh, the Monday following a Sunday is a very unusual experience, particularly for church life. But uh, it's very apropos and fitting, because for the Christmas Eve service and the New Year's Eve service on a Sunday evening, when Calvary is so strong anyway, and her tradition for Sunday night is a happy occasion. We're going to try tonight to have a wonderful time of celebration and happy praise and something to think about. There'll be chairs in the Galleria and throughout the area there, and uh, we'll have special lighting and music, and uh, we hope that you'll come in a sweater, a casual attire, no ties and shirts, unless you'd uh, like to do that, or coats. Just come very relaxed. And we'll be together as a family as if we were in a huge family room or a grand room praising the Lord and uh, starting our new year right. We will have a service at 6 o'clock to about 7, 7, 10. And then the rest of the evening, the various groups and age interest Sunday school classes will be having their celebrations as the evening goes on. Thank you for being with us today. The program of the day is listed there in your program and also the opportunities of the week. We hope that you will participate as best as you can in all the phases of Calvary's life, which are geared and focused primarily to help you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we begin our worship also with the reading of God's Word from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. Darren McGrew, who leads our assimilation and follow-up and outreach ministry, as well as the pastor to Singles 2, the career singles, will lead us in the reading of God's Word. Let's take our scripture and listen to God as he speaks to us through his inerrant text. God bless us now as we read. In the third chapter of the book of Proverbs, God's Word says, Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the tablet of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. 
Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. This is the word of God. Now let us find that solitude, that rest, that quietness and confidence which God says is our strength as we bow in prayer and bring our hearts and our devotion to the throne of grace. Shall we bow in prayer together? Our Father, as thousands of us this morning here and around the world, wherever your name is honored and wherever your throne is known, we along with hundreds of millions of others obey our conscience and exalt your name. We bow before thee because there are no other gods other than those that we have made and we repent of those and we smash them today in the futility of the hypocrisy of our hearts and we look again and concentrate and focus on thee the only true and living and eternal God we marvel at your patience with the race that you have created. We love thee because you loved us first. We devote ourselves to thee because everything else is a sham and leads to the dissipation of hope and the sourness of our spirits. We thank thee for thy presence with us this morning. This is your house, and we have given it to thee. And we continue to make it and to minister through it so that your name would be exalted and known, so that your Son would be believed and followed, and so that your Spirit would have dominion. And so we ask that you will fill us with your holy presence today. If we have come disheveled in spirit, if we have come contaminated because of the corruption that is in the world through desire and greed, we ask that you will cleanse us and wash us and baptize us with a sense of awe and holiness. And we pray even that the fringes of the garments of our soul today would be freshly cleansed for thou hast said, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, as we are in a proper attitude toward thee, then you will reveal yourself to us. We pray for the guidance of heaven this year in our lives and in our world. We pray for family life. We pray for our children. We pray as parents that we would be given the renewed sensitivity of parenting in a godly way of being examples and models to our children. We pray for our children, young and old. We pray for our children with us and those that are grandchildren. We pray that during this next year, no evil will befall us, nor any plague come nigh our dwelling. We pray not only for our spiritual health, but we pray for all of those today that are physically ill or who recently have dealt with the closeness of death. Strengthen all. Strengthen all today, we pray, especially Judy Burgess. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will be with her in Hickory this morning. We ask now for the blessing of heaven to be upon this house and upon this congregation in this new year. You have, with great wisdom, led us and guided us. Now we look to you to be as faithful in the future as you have been in the past, and that we would be also faithful to the heavenly vision 
to preach the gospel to every creature and to bring the gospel to the lost, particularly to those who are up and out and who do not yet know the sensitivity to their own sin and the perilous plight of those without your saving grace. For our world and its need, for missionaries and broadcasting stations and for literature distribution centers, for quiet witness in difficult places, we ask your blessing. We would not be selfish and just focus on our own anxieties and fears this morning. We would ask that you would enable us to enlarge our vision, to expand our vista, and to encompass a world today for which you came, for which you gave your Son, and to which you need now to have the message broadcast. So enable us. We are your servants. Melt us, mold us, make us, fill us, and use us in your will in this new year, as right now we consecrate ourselves to thee again in Jesus' blessed and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Our beautiful hymn, number 405, can be sung without the instruments. And I'm going to ask on the second stanza, Dan, if you will just sing with us and we'll sing a cappella. Other than that, we'll sing to him all the way through. Number 405, we'll remain seated. That's just a great congregation seeing this tune and these words which speak of the solidarity of our faith and our collective worship of our living God.
There isn't any of us who, during this time of year, hasn't uh, seen, while probably standing at the grocery line, the headline of a tabloid or some of the magazine in which ten or more seers, as they're called, were called upon to give some predictions for the new year. There's something about the cycle of the changing of the year as we deal with chronology that leads us to think that the changing of the calendar or the next decade, as is the exciting challenge of our present sequence, will make or will not make a significant difference in our lives. There's something inscrutable about this psyche, about this thought that we are being maybe moved more by events and circumstances or time segments than we are by our own initiative. And so we say, I wonder what this decade will mean. I wonder what it will bring, as if it was like the surprise of the strong wind this morning when we got out to come to church. We looked out and it was raining, but I think as we got outside, we didn't realize the wind was blowing with such gust as it was. And some of us look at life that way, as if all of a sudden there are some events that are going to take place that will determine so that the future is more a reaction to what is inevitable than that which we can chart or establish or mark for ourselves. Of course, this involves the philosophy of time and space continuums, and it involves, the, of course, the view of life. If we have a fatalistic view of the future, that things are just tumbling down, that things just take place, like uh, any other cycle of nature, by some inscrutable hand or by some sovereign God who may or may not be detached from the world, then we build, as it were, a defense mechanism. We react more than we act. And we go with the flow, as we say, because what is going to be will be, come see, come sigh. Or we can say that that which takes place is a combination of that, that there are some things that are set in order by a sovereign God or by whatever. If you're not a Christian this morning, you don't postulate a God. But the things happen and then we respond to them. And there's a sense in which we can correct these trends. And here you have that very mysterious balance between what theology has struggled with even till this morning. The sovereign will of God, the indisputable and unchanging and immutable nature of God, and man and his free will and his capacity to alter or to change or to respond in a certain way. Or you can take the third view, which is that there isn't any sovereign God and there aren't any sequences in nature that involves man other than man's response to nature, but that the man is really the distributor of the events of life. That the universe is not established by a God who is out there, as Paul Tilly called him, but that the God who is here is here. I am the God. I am the center of the universe. I am who I am. And therefore, what happens is what I determine. Therefore, I should take control of my life and do with it what I think is best and also take control of other people's lives so that they will not bump me or radicalize me or change me to the point that it brings me unhappiness. Now, I suppose there may be other views of the future, than those, but I doubt it. They're about the three basic options. Now, the Christian worldview is in the center position. It is that God is sovereign, but God in his sovereignty has released some of his control. He has dispatched to man a certain sense of freedom and arbitrarily, because he is God, established to make himself in his own image and allow his creature and his creation to be radicalized, to be devoted, to be that which departs from him or that which abides and rests in him. So God is sovereign, but man has been given a certain sense of sovereignty, and his sovereignty is this sphere. And what he does, he's accountable to God for, but what he does, he does. God doesn't lose control. God is not out of focus. God alters and corrects as his sovereign will is determined. But he does that within the purview 
of the permission that he has given to man to either love him or hate him, to either go with him or depart from him. Now, of course, as we look at our age and our time, we realize that things are happening that we do not directly control. We certainly have seen uh, a tremendous decade, and you've probably read some articles, and and uh, tomorrow or tonight, whenever they're going to show it, you'll see some of the past replayed. It's hard to uh, sketch, as it were, a decade and what has happened. Think of what has happened to this congregation. That in itself would be a marvelous, surprising study. It's hard to believe that the beginning of this decade, the 80s, was was started with, uh, with uh, E.T. and uh, his coming, as it were. $715 million in theater tickets and $2.1 billion in the spin-off products. E.T., extraterrestrial. There was a visit, as it were, implanted in the minds of people that something outside could come into our world. And the changes and the radical dynamics of this decade is just hard to imagine. There wasn't a fax machine. Maybe 10,000 were sold in 1982. And now millions. And car telephones. There were only 32,000 car telephones in 1980. And now there are half a million. And I saw two portable units while this week went by. Now there's a small unit about the size of a pocket diary uh, that doesn't have any cords or wires or anything, and you can take it everywhere and dial all over the world. And they're going to get smaller, of course, all the time. The ability to communicate, the ability to travel, and the ability to see the world, of course, has been part of the radicalization of our world. And this is what, of course, has happened in Eastern Europe. East Germany watched West German television. The communication system was open and people began to see that there is another way to live. And probably the answer is not just in trusting leaders, but in the redistribution of, of wealth, which of course was the heart and the core of communism. And so the world is changing and it changes so radically and it's changing so quickly that we can well imagine that maybe the E2 idea, the ET idea, can bring to us the realization that there might be another image much more attractive and much more articulate who might be a a person who would be accepted by the world as a global messiah as they're shouting Gorby, Gorby, Gorby and there is a cult for a strong leader and a, and a desire of the nations of the world for somebody to bring us all together, not only religiously but politically, and those stepping stones seem to be placed now in the sidewalk of humanity. We might be in our own generation, in the next ten years, before the turn of the century, and how quickly years come and go, see the stage set and the furniture be put into place for the curtain to be drawn of the coming of the brutality of the Antichrist, who will first lie to the world and speak peace and look as if he's bringing harmony, and then when he sees his control of the world, the world then begins to come to part, and at the end of that period, a seven-year period, as the Bible says, Jesus Christ returns. A wonderful hope, though, for the believer is that he doesn't look for the Antichrist, he doesn't look for the centrality of political power, he looks for the Lord Jesus in heaven. And he will be lifted out. He will be raptured out. He will be taken away before the Holocaust that comes upon the world. The faith that keeps you abiding in Christ today will deliver you from the wrath to come. Paul wrote that to the Thess Thessalonians and wanted the believers there not to be part of the great deception, the big lie, it caused them to think that their focus should be on anything else than the hope and the joy of the gospel. Now, one of the great establishing marks for us this morning, and, and again, a brief message tonight, is to ask ourselves, how does God lead? How does God alter the furniture on the stage of the program of history? If we could determine how God leads and what His will is and how he determines things. If we could find out what pleases him, if we could fall into, as it were, the jet stream 
of His flow. If we could find out the principles of living, if we could determine what really brings happiness, what causes our lives to be anointed with gladness and to bring us a sense of purpose and direction in the months and the years to come, we would find for ourselves this morning the greatest answer to whatever the question may be concerning the future. How does God lead? How does God guide? How can I determine that in this next decade, in this next week, I can be properly directed and led by Him for my good and for His glory? I want to speak about that this morning. And I want to see if in each of us there can come a clear picture of God's determination for our lives and for His desire for us as we seek to live for His glory. I'm going to ask you to turn to some passages this morning in the Psalms. I'd like you to go first, please. And we'll take these in steps this morning so it will be easy for us. To Psalm 25, and we'll begin with verse 9. God leads and God guides those who establish for themselves the attitude that God must always be assumed as being right and just, always fair, and that whatever the record has shown or whatever the fears may be, God can be trusted in everything. Psalm 25 in verse 9. The meek will he guide in all of the decisions of life, the meaning of the word judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Verse 12, what man is he that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell in ease, and his seed, his family, and the family to come shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. The fear of the Lord, and we're going to conclude our message with this thought, the fear of the Lord is is justified apprehension. Let me put it that way. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, the capacity to know what is to be known is to have a proper, proper reverential trust for God. That God is holy. He's almighty. He also is intimate. He is wrath, and yet He is love. He is mercy, He is grace. He is just and fair. He never has to be disputed with. He's always right. And to have that understanding and attitude of God is the meaning of the word fear. And the Bible says if you fear the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It also says to fear the Lord is to despise that which displeases Him. The English translation is the fear of the Lord is to hate sin. And God wants us to fear Him, to have justified apprehension. To understand the way he works, to understand the way he thinks, to determine what he wants, and to do what pleases him. And the Bible says that attitude is called meekness. It has nothing to do with being shy or timid or wimpish. The Bible says in the book of Numbers, Moses, my servant, is very meek. And Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And Jesus said in Matthew 11, I am meek and I am lowly in heart. So meekness is a strength. Meekness is a virtue. It means that everything that happens in life, you place at the feet of God. That God is sovereign, that He is Lord, and your attitude toward Him should be one of confidence and trust. 
that you should not dispute, resent, resist, argue, debate, or call into question his mighty ways. And those people that have that kind of mindset and that kind of attitude, the Bible says, God will lead those people. He will guide those people. So there's a sense in which in the new year, you not only need to resign yourself to the fact that God is almighty, but that you need to keep before you an attitude of reverential trust and fear of God. He will never fail. He is Lord. He is in complete control today of everything. The heart of the king, the Bible says, is in the hand of the Lord, and he directs all things. And he may use a leader. He may use a nation. He may use the acts of nature, which he all creates, because every star bears his name, and every lightning bolt has come at the end of his finger. And all of the variegation of nature is controlled by his inscrutable fiat, his divine will. All of this is his. He is Lord of all and will never be dethroned. And because of that, those who love him and follow him have a attitude of meekness and reliance and trust. And when this attitude is planted, when it is resident in your life, he will lead you. Meekness, of course is the opposite of arrogance. Meekness has to do with humility. It doesn't mean that you don't take initiative. It doesn't mean that you are not assertive. It means that all that you do, whether you are passive or active in life, you do with regard for the fact that He is God. And you trust and rely in Him. Now the question is this morning, do you have that attitude today? And will you have that attitude next year? particularly in things that are difficult or hard to swallow or hard to take or even probably more so in our society of things of blessing and abundance and affluence. It's the best of life that is contaminating us, not the worst. It's the fact that we have grown indifferent and thoughtless and thankless about the goodness of life that has created the encrustation and the callousness over our hearts. We this year need to rely completely on God, even though we are blessed and healthy and happy and have the finest medical systems and we have a great economic system and so on. And even though our jobs are stable, it is in the time of blessing and in the time of blight that our total reliance must be upon God. The question is, are you ready to posture yourself for the new year and the next decade with that mindset? Because those people who have that attitude are those that will be guided by God because they fear Him. They have a justified apprehension that to disobey God will bring His judgment and their own disappointment. And to please God will cause God to please and to bless them. A second passage and a second principle of the day is found in Psalm 31 in verse 3. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. There is the meekness of the previous psalm. Let me never be ashamed or insecure or intimidated. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock. For an house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Read the next line with me, will you? Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. The first principle is that I must be meek and sensitive. I must be dependent upon God. That in all things, without dispute or reservation, resistance or disobedience, I will trust him inscrutably. The second principle is that I remember that God blesses, leads, and guides those who bear His name, and He also protects them and sustains them. In Psalm 25, the word guide is a unique Hebrew word, and it has to do with lifestyle. The word guide here is another Hebrew word, and it refers to that which is a protectorate or a fortress or that which sustains or strengthens. In fact, the word fortress is a Latin word, fortis, 
and it means to be strong. In music, you have fortissimo, which means loud or strong. And this is the root of this word. You are my fortress. You are my strength. You are my buoyance. You make me to feel as if I can make it. And the fortresses, of course, were cities of strength where people could find refuge. And all the cities, as you know, in the Old Testament era, were walled cities. So this concept came to be a, a interpretation of the soul's and the spirit's reliance upon God. And he guides and leads because the foundation of life is trust in him. The underpinning, the floor. Look at the text. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, will you guide me and lead me. God is obligated to his people. God is obligated to keep you. God is obligated to keep you from falling. God is obligated to always protect you from that which would mean separation from him forever. You are saved forever. You are kept by his power. You are saved by his grace. You will never be lost. Eternal security is not only a doctrine codified by the church. It is the basic message of the entire word of God. He is married even to the backslider. You will never be lost. And so God has obligated himself to you by giving you his name. You're in the family. You're in the herd book. You're in the will. You shall never be lost. And so this provides for the believer a sense of strength, provided, of course, as the scripture says, that we believe that and we conceive that and we begin to behave in that way and we make him our foundation and we make him our solace point and we make him our fortress. But unfortunately, in our society, we substitute alternatives and we look to job, for instance, of all the things that hold you together today, primarily psychologists are telling, it is your job. The job is the primary bond for the American. The primary bond for Eastern Europe is freedom. The primary bond for people in Africa is maybe one meal this week. What is the primary bond? What would cause your life to fall apart? It isn't missing lunch. It isn't really the change of the weather. The thing that shakes up and disturbs and radicalizes and brings mental instability to the American is his job. It's job security. It's number one. A man will even be unfaithful to his wife based on the fact that he could step up and move ahead in his company. If he alters his home domestic lifestyle based on the partying and the trade-offs in business and contract and so on, he will slight anything and everything if necessary to keep his job. The primary bond. What is the primary bond of America? Economy, money, job security. And these other things are sometimes secondary and uh, even farther down the list. What should be the primary bond of the believer? His ground, his primary bond, the epoxy, is the fact that God is his strength. God is his floor. God is his rock. God is defense for him. Job said, I know what's coming apart. I know what it appears to be like. And I know what you might think with friends like that who needs enemies. But even if God kills me and doesn't explain it to me, I will then trust him because I know that someday I shall see my Redeemer and I will stand before him in that day. Now, it's almost impossible for a, a pastor, a minister, or somebody who is trying to get this across to us. It's almost impossible for us to get that through to our psyche. Because our world, the Western world, our country doesn't live on that level. It lives on a physical level. It lives on a materialistic level. It lives on a visible level. It lives on a level of sensory appreciation and gratification. And it's hard for us as Christians to be heavenly minded in a world that is so powerfully indulgent. And to say that this morning for this next year, come hell or high water, come an explanation or not, I will make my total reliance 
I will make my fortress. Don't make the word symbolic. Make the word what it really means to be, strength. I will make the strength and the momentum and the vitality of life God and His faithfulness to me. And if you do that, God will guide you. If you do that, the windows of your life will not be opaque. They'll be transparent. You'll be able to see the clouds. You'll be able to see the future. You'll know that God is faithful. He is behind you. He is your underpinning. And no good thing will He withhold from you because you walk uprightly. That's a Bible verse. So the second principle of the day is that He guides because He's obligated. He guides those who are His namesake. Now the question is this morning, are you His namesake? Are you in the family? Do you know Him? Are you just an onlooker? Are you a believer? Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Have you made the floor of your life God and only God and His Son, Jesus Christ? If you have, you've got a great future. If you haven't, you'll zigzag, you'll waffle, you'll be unstable, you'll be lost, you'll be in a quandary, you'll be in a maze, you won't have any sense at all to history or to your own personal life. He guides those who are totally relying on Him, the meek. And He guides those who are His namesake, who make Him their sole strength. All right, let's go to principle three. Let's turn, for instance, to Psalm 32. Not very far. Down to verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I shall guide thee with thine eye. So don't be as a horse or a mule that don't have any understanding. Their mouths have to be held tight by the bit and the bridle over their heads. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusts in the Lord, mercy shall encircle him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for, glo for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Look at verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee and guide thee. Now the eye, of course, is the window to the soul. Studies have shown that by looking at the eye, you can see right into the psyche. A doctor is checking, let's say, a pain in the stomach will look into your eye. Someone who is a physician of the eye can tell a great deal about stress and not only the abuse of the eye or the adjusting of the lens or whatever, the eye is the window to the soul. For instance, if you see something very awful or unhappy or violent, you will, you will uh, find that uh, the lens of your eye and the pupil of your eye will adjust. Things of grandeur and wonder, also the eye will adjust. It's an amazing thing. And the Bible says that we are the pupil. We are the apple is the, is the English word. The meaning is pupil. We are the center of God's eye. In other words, God sees us. When He looks out, as it were, this this uh, anthropomorphism, which is a word that describes a human characteristic that we give to God to better understand Him, that when God looks out, He looks and He sees us. We're in the center of His vision. Now, when you look at that concept, it becomes larger. And we understand that God guides us with His eye. And so we're looking at Him and He is looking at us. And there is direct communication. Sometimes the best communication can be not even a word, but just looking at somebody's eye. You can tell by watching how their eyes work. And so the concept is that as we're face to face, head on, eyeball to eyeball, straight with God, as we're looking at Him, He, he guides us and He leads us. Now how does He do that? Let's go to a passage of Scripture in the New Testament, to the book of Romans chapter 15. Because it's obvious at this point that we can't look into the face of God and, and, and we can't eyeball Him, as we say. But the word teach, the word teach in the text, in the Psalms, give us a great leader, an indicator here. In the book of Romans, chapter 15 and verse 4, we read, For whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. 
Read that verse with me, those of you that have your Bibles this morning. Let's read it again. It's a great verse. Romans 15 and verse 4. Together, For whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. Now, there are three words here that are important. The first is learning. The second word is patience. And the third word is comfort. And then the residue is, of course, that which comes from it all, and it is hope. Now, the word scriptures are the key thoughts there. The scriptures were written, this is the document of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the documents of the church and the documents of the fathers of the faith were written as time went on, and these things that were chronicled before our time were written for our lessons, for our learning. They provided the guideposts. So as we learn the Scripture, and as we understand what the Bible says, the word Bible, of course, is the word book, as we understand what was written for our learning, the Bible says the learning process brings the second step, which is patience, the ability to deal, the ability to hold on, the ability to cope, the ability to manage, the ability to plan, a time of patience or endurance or hang on is a time for re-examination and adjustment and goal setting and evaluation of priorities. Patience is not only just gritting your teeth and grinding, as it were, the sand of your soul, it is a time of evaluation. You step back. You're put on hold. There's a pause. You're hanging fire, as we say. So by learning what has been written, I might have a time to reevaluate. I'm put on hold. I have to be patient. And this patience, look at the scripture, brings me comfort, brings me security, brings me warmth, brings me a contentment. And when I learn that, I have hope. I have aspiration. I have relief. I can face the future. Now, what does this psychological sequential pattern, what does it tell us? It tells us that God leads us and guides us by our attitude of meekness, by the obligation to us as we are His people, as we make Him our basis of life and strength, but also that there are documents and scriptures and passages and writings that if we learn them, if we cognitively learn them, if we understand the rules of the game, as it were, we will then have patience, and that will give us the ability to feel confident, which is the meaning for the word comfort, the opposite of insecurity. And we will have hope and aspiration and a dynamism that heretofore was impossible when we, un when we didn't understand how God worked. Now this is the value of the scripture. This church would not have a chance if it wasn't for the integrity of the scripture. Any church can serve meals, any church can play music, any church can have daycare, any church can have a beautiful building, any church, if it wants to, can find out what the people really want and need and give it to them and it will be a success. Study the market, meet people's need, and you've got it. And be good in your service to the people's desires. But that's not the church. That's not the heart of what the church is. The only merchandise, the only clothing, the only accessory, the only thing that the church has that is truly authentic and inscrutably unique is the Word of God. That's all. Men can speak, men come and go. Fads and trends in church growth and church life are as variegated as the styles of our ties this morning, those men who are wearing them. But the essence of the whole message is the Word of God. If it were not for the Word of God, we wouldn't know what God was, or what He wanted, or what He had in mind, or who He sent. It comes through the Scripture. And the ability for the Christian to be guided and directed and led by God, and to know what to do in the future, his decision-making process must be guided and manicured by a proper and thorough understanding of the Scripture. These were written for our learning, that 
through patience and comfort, we might have hope. God does not lead ignorant saints. He cannot guide you and direct you if you don't know this book. And that's why the pulpit is in the center of this church. Not because the pastor is prominent, but because it is a statement. There isn't an altar here. We're not reenacting Calvary. The center of this church is the Bible. The Reformed tradition brought back the Scripture to the center of the congregation. The center of worship is not the congregation. The purpose of worship is not celebration. The purpose of worship is to listen to, to understand, and to be ready to be committed to the obedience of God's holy word and will. And so as you understand that, you'll be guided and you'll have comfort and strength for this coming year. The third principle, God leads those who understand the principles and the guidelines that he has inscrutably, perfectly, ideally established for his people. Let's go to a fourth principle and come to a conclusion. Let's go to Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is a, is a magnificent psalm. And I must bring this to a close. I want to go to one more psalm. But 73 ought to be a psalm that you ought to read over and over again. It's beautiful because it shows a mood swing. It shows, it shows a temperament. It shows discouragement, disillusionment. And then it shows how the mind can be freed up. Let me express it to you quickly. The writer looks at the world and he says, you know, it doesn't really pay to trust in God. God doesn't really deal with his people, those who trust in him, the meek and all those things that we mentioned this morning, any differently than he deals with other people. In fact, when I look at what I have and I look at what other people have, those other people, whoever they are, this is just a case study, as it were, a scenario, I, I think, frankly, that the people that do evil do better. I think they have a better chance, it seems to be. They're happier, they're more prosperous, they're making it easier, their comfort systems are stronger. I feel like I'm out in the rain this morning and trusting in God. Why, the prosperity of the people who don't pay any attention to God, in fact, those people that are arrogant toward God and say, hey, bust off, God, those people seem to just have it made. So when I look at it all, I'm not saying God is unfair. I don't want to be called up on the carpet for that. But the comparison is obvious. That the prosperity of the wicked seems to be big and strong and healthy, whereas the righteous are barely making it. And this disparagement, this inequity is going through the mind of the writer. Hey, we can identify with that. And then he says, I finally got my head on straight. I looked into the eye of God. I went into a sanctuary, into the church. And then I realized that that was way off and I was totally wrong. Look at the text. Verse 24, Psalm 73 was the verse, the verse I wanted to give you. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. There are three strong verbs here. Verse 23, you hold me with your right hand. Verse 24, you guide me. And verse 24, you receive me. Now look at verse 12. Take a look at this, he says. These are the godly. They prosper in the world and they increase in riches. In 1980, there were 5,200 millionaires in 1980. In 1990, there are close to 36,000 millionaires in the United States. The haves are having more. And all of us look at our world and we see this disparagement in spite of the fact that the Noriegas and the others seem to be facing their payday. But nevertheless, nevertheless, 
There's a sense in which it is true that the unrighteous are like a flourishing tree with a lot of blossoms. And those who seek desperately to trust in God seem to be at the end of the line. This isn't a feel sorry for yourself Christian time. This is what the psalmist is saying, and I think it's indisputable. But there are two keys to this malfocus. Verse 12, it says they prosper in the world. And in verse 24, those that God guides, it says they receive glory. We all talk about the last chapter in life, the final chapter, payday someday and so on. This sphere, this world, this time and space category, this hyphen between the two dates on somebody's tombstone, this little pause, it's not even an interlude, it's not even an intermission, it's not even a recess, it is so small, the amount of time that one person lives compared to eternity, fathom it just for a minute. 60, 70, 80, I saw my dad this week, 95. 95, that seems such a long time. But in the light of timelessness, in the light, we can't find a better word for it, infinity, in eternity, when there is no uh, 31, 1131, when there is no Sunday, when there is no decade, when there is nothing, absolutely nothing, a flow and a stream of beingness that never ends. In the light of that, 95 years is not even a breath. So the apprehension and the approach for this next year should be an approach of a concept of eternity, a concept of of the implication of living in such a way right here and now so that foreverness, eternity, is guaranteed for me in glory. That everything else is a mirage. It is. It's a mirage. And God guides people who keep their eyes on that, who have a particular focus. And if this next year you need anything, you need a focus for eternity. Darren read from the Proverbs this morning about giving the first of the increase to God. The way we spend our money. You know, in 1980, there were only about six or 7,000 uh, VCRs. Now everybody's got a VCR. It's not the VCR. We've got one. It's the software. People are popping 50 bucks for this and $57 for that. People now have a library of software for the VCRs with these video games. And we gave things like that at Christmas and never thought about it. Popped it on the charge. When was the last time you popped $50 in an offering? The average gift... Of all the people, when we take the $5,000 and the $2,000, which are very rare, the checks and the money from this congregation on the Sunday morning, and probably 40% uh, of the people don't give anything, the average gift of all the people on an average Sunday morning is about $21. And there are people who give generously and compensate for the large number of people that let the basket go by. I mentioned that, and I very seldom mention money at that level, is to bring you into focus. The way you spend your money is the interpretation of what you value. What you think something is worth initiates your purchase. And so what we purchase and what we buy is an indicator. It is an x-ray of what we like and what we prefer. How we spend our money is a better window to the spiritual nature of our souls than our Bible studies. 
So, in the light of eternity, will I be led and guided by Him and be received in glory when I have a proper focus of what is the meaning of life and what is the value of money and what should be the pursuit of my life. This is what the psalmist is saying. Let's go to one more psalm. Let's go to 112. I'll read it while you turn to it. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord that delights greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be an everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. He trusts the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved, they'll be frustrated by the lifestyle of the saint. He shall gnash with his teeth, he shall melt away, the desire of the wicked shall perish. I put down this week, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen things that characterize the person that God guides. Look at them. First, he will have a strong family. Verse 2. He will have influence on others. The generation, the generation of the upright shall be blessed. If you're guided and led and blessed by God, if you're properly focused, do you know what influence you can have on other people? Do you know the impact that you can have on others if your life is right with God? Everybody is following somebody. Everybody is a leader. Some are leaders by a lot of people. Some are leaders of a few people, but everybody is a leader. Everybody is being watched. And the influence and the impact of one life is amazing. If you are a righteous person, you can infect your entire generation. And then the person is godlike. Characteristics of God, verse 4, gracious, full of compassion. He does what's right. He's sensitive to others. He's generous. He's discerning, verse 6. He's stable and reliable, verse 8. He trusts in God in spite of the consequences, verse 9. He is a person of integrity. He has permanent influence. And look at the text. The scripture says that he is blessed of God because he fears the Lord. I suppose that would be something I would desire this year more than anything else. The theme of this passage. That I would not only truly, let me reiterate, the best way to learn is to keep repeating it. That I not only would be meek and sensitive and dependent upon God and without a spirit of dispute or argumentation or rebellion. That I would be as Moses and I would be as Jesus. I would be constantly relying on God's inscrutable and holy and perfect will. And that I should be such a person that I would realize that he owns me and he loves me. And I will never be lost. And that brings such comfort and strength because of the precarious nature of the future. But that this namesake brings an obligation. That I should also live for him and depend upon him for all my comings and my goings. And then that I should take the scripture as Jeremiah said, thy words were found, and I did eat them like a sandwich, and they became joy, and they nourished my soul, that the scripture would be bread, that I would eat it, that it would be honey, that it would be sweet, that it would be a light and a lamp unto my path, and it would guide me, and I should learn the lessons of scripture, that by patience and comfort, I might have the aspiration and the great dynamism that's needed for this coming year. 
But then there's a sense in which I should really have a proper evaluation of my life. The milieu of my world might be focused on eternity. That I should realize that I'm marking now a record that will be read in heaven. That everybody will be accountable unto God for all the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad, and have such a disposition of makeup, such an evaluation of life, that everything should be done in the light of the fact that He will hold me and guide me and receive me into glory. What a tremendous view of the future. What a tremendous hold on life I would have if I lived everything in the light of that which is inevitable and sure to come, and that which will be never-ending Facing God and living with the consequences of this life. Eternity. With no ability to alter or change it. Once it begins. And then that I should have a fear and a reverence for God. That my life might be molded and made and shaped in such a way. That my family and my seed and my generation. And all that are around me. Feel the influence of a godlike character. That I might be gracious and merciful and full of compassion. God will lead such people. He's obligated to do that. And the question is, are you going to be of that mindset? Are you going to be of that disposition? Are you going to begin not tomorrow? The best rule for making resolutions is to keep the list small and to make the resolutions that you can really keep. Don't make a long list. The sense of failure builds up quickly and you lose all the momentum that you hoped that you had. Make a short list. I will do this. And secondly, don't make a list tomorrow. Make it today. Don't begin tomorrow to diet. Diet today. Don't begin tomorrow to be loving. Be loving today. Don't begin tomorrow to be disciplined. Be disciplined today. Don't begin tomorrow to be generous. Be jealous today. Be generous for God in the moment. Realize that today is all you have. No man knows what a day will bring forth. For what is your life? It's as a vapor. It appears for a while and it vanisheth away. Ten years from now, maybe 35% of this congregation won't even be alive. Who knows? Nobody knows. So there's a sense in which I need to get my priorities exactly established. And today I must be yielded and committed and appropriately focused to my world. And then live in such a way that there will be no turning back. That there will be no defeat. That there will be no way in which my life cannot be pleasing to God. And whether it be this afternoon... Or the afternoon of the future to come, I will face him unashamed, standing before him in the boldness of his blood and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. Be guided, be led by God. How to do that is to be, not to do. The being is more important than doing. Be the person that God has directed that you should be. And begin that right this minute, right now, right this very split second. Say, become, and be. Take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee. And he will guide you. Shall we pray? Our Father, this morning we ask for a special dispensation of your grace. A very, very special sense of what is right. And what is immediate. And what is ultimate. I pray this morning as never before in this pulpit, in this room. For a great movement of the Spirit of God. On this congregation. A great sense of nowness. A great sense of immediate response to what we know is right. I pray for the total defeat of the devil in all of his work and way. I pray for the destruction of procrastination. 
I pray for the demise of hesitancy. I pray, O oh Lord, that in spite of what others we think are thinking, and what are the plans we have that we must be responsible for, that in the next five, six, seven, or eight minutes, as long as it takes, Lord, you will move within us to make us plan for our future and be yielded completely and totally to Thee. I pray that. I pray that not just for a handful. I pray it for a large number of people in this church this morning. Many of them who have honored Thee and who have come this morning, but who had no thought at all when they came in, that they would be openly, publicly making a commitment of their lives to Thee. I pray for a great sense of confession, a great sense of, sense of cleansing, and a time now as we sing this hymn of strong personal commitment in behalf of a great host of people. Lord, you know my heart, and you know everybody's heart. It's all on your screen. There's not a person in the world who in your sight can play both sides. And so try us and weigh us and deliver us from all fear and cause many this morning to be consecrated and yielded and publicly committed to Thee. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am looking this morning to the Lord to cause many of you to say as we stand and sing this hymn. Now there are six verses. I would suggest we take the first verse, the second verse, the fourth verse, and the fifth verse. One, two, four, and five. We'll sing these verses. And I'm going to ask that no one leave. I would like this morning to have a reasonably protracted invitation. Not long. I know it's a busy day, but it's a holiday tomorrow. And I've been asking the Holy Spirit to take a hold of some of us. Not to shake us. Not to slap us. Not to push us down. God doesn't do that. But to lovingly guide us and direct us. And say, hey fella. Now listen, this is the way it's going to be. You can't love and not discipline. And discipline without love is anger. God wants to lovingly train us and put us in the right way. And there are many of you this morning. In the balcony, you would have the best excuse not to do a thing. But come along that area. The ushers will come down and stand there to direct you. Just come down these stairs. And I'm asking many this morning to come and say on this last day of this year, at the beginning of the decade, and what's a decade? It's just something that we create in a way. But at least now, as we're thinking about the new year and the new century, I today am going to be established in the fortress on the ground floor of being totally yielded to God. You know what I'm talking about. You got the point halfway through the message. I should stop talking and I will. But you have to publicly, openly acknowledge that to your generation. You have to confess that before people. If you don't do it publicly this morning, there's not much chance you're going to do it in the workplace. You need to do it among God's people. And start today to take your stand and to boldly say from this moment on, I'm yielded and committed to Jesus Christ. He's the head of my life. I'm going to be meek this morning and strong and trust in Him. And if you're not sure where you're going and you're not sure that heaven is your home and you've never been saved, that's a Bible word, you've never been saved, you come this morning and say, I'm going to be a real Christian this morning. I'm going to be a Christian. I mean, I'm going to be a Christian. And I'm going to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I think I've said enough. And I pray that hundreds of Christians be praying strongly as you've never prayed before, that at the end of this service, many will come and openly acknowledge Jesus Christ 
And I'm going to ask you to stand there. Don't go away as the counselors usually are asked to do. I want you to stand there and we're going to have a prayer. And then we'll have the counseling. All right? Are we ready? May God help us and lead us. Shall we stand and sing? And as we start to sing, you come and you'll be surprised. Many will come as they watch you in your open commitment. Let us sing. Take my life and let me be consecrated for to be. Take my hope as my light is. Let the glorious things let's praise. Let them fifth stanza before we sing it take my will and make it thine that's the key the will that's where you decide things you think about it you feel it then you do it some of you are thinking about it you feel it but you need to do it you need to move you need to take my feet they may feel heavy you've got to go out to dinner you got an appointment I'm going a little longer than usual you need to get out of here is getting out of here more important than you making a momentous, irreversible commitment to Jesus Christ? You say, well, I'll do it later. You won't do it later. You're disobeying by not doing it now. I don't think everybody ought to come. But there are many of you, maybe close to hundreds of you, who have never personally, openly, in confession said, my life belongs to God in Christ. And I'm going to commit it openly to him this morning. Take my will. Let's sing. Will you come? Take my will. Each of you this morning who has come, may the Lord give you unusual joy and relief and a sense of perfect harmony with the Lord as I with you this morning make that beautiful and worthy commitment to the Lord Jesus to give him our hearts and our lives again. Will you pray with me? Our Father, for those who stand in this outward, open way, bring to their lives a sense of great peace now, a sense of rightness, a sense of power, and fill them with the Holy Spirit in an intoxicating way 
that the joy of the Lord will be their strength. And as they have submitted to you for guidance and direction, as they have made total allegiance open and above board today, now give them early indication this day and tomorrow that you are doing exactly what you promised, abundantly above all they could ask or think. Bless them and fulfill them, we pray. And for all who possibly this morning did not yield but need to, may throughout this day they feel such unhappiness and restlessness until probably by the end of the day they will be on their knees, yielding and totally committing to your Lordship. Thank you for this great service this morning, for the Sunday school hour, for the Bible teaching, for the care with the children, for the joy of our music, and for the freedom and the relaxation of this afternoon. Bring us back to this house tonight with great blessing, we ask. And abide with us in unbelievable levels in this new year. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask now we bow for our benediction as Thurman Stone leads us. And before that, would you please be seated. Well, the ushers come now for the offering of the morning as Daryl Heisler sings for us. And then Thurman Stone will have our benediction of the day. If the sky and galaxies declare your holy name, if all creation finds the words your power to proclaim, how can I articulate with words and with my days your glory and your majesty and live a life of praise and live a life of praise you oh lord i will praise you my voice will join the chorus that all creation sings praise my Redeemer, my Savior and King. If stars can find a way to tell the glory of their King, and if the very firmament can find a way to sing. How can I keep silent now and not burst into song in praise of my Redeemer who has loved me all along? Then, Lord, I've got to praise you. Oh, Lord, I will praise you. My voice will join the chorus that all creation sings. Praise you, oh Lord, I will praise you, my master, my redeemer, my savior. and